Okay. So, good everybody. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Obiara Maludum. Um, he's a structural interventional cardiologist in the U.S. at uh, Blunt Memorial Hospital, Tennessee. And he will be giving us a lecture today on management of conduction abnormalities um, following TAVI. So um, we encourage you to kindly listen and uh, we, we, we look forward to a very uh, good learning experience from you, sir. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think I need to share my screen so you guys can see the slides. Yes. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about tabular related conduction abnormalities, the incidence, clinical impact and um, management, and I have nothing to disclose. Um, so like I said, um, TAVA uh, procedure, the, uh, the device that we use for the procedures, the mechanism of uh, deployment and everything has actually improved um, over the years. And um, so you, you find out that majority of the complications that we have after TAVA have markedly reduced, like vascular complication, paravalvular leak and all that. They have all basically improved. But unfortunately, the conduction disturbances that we have uh, during TAVA has not actually improved that much. Um, owing one to the um, proximity of the conduction system to the LT valve where we deploy um, the, the TAVA valves. And majority of the conduction abnormality, we have a high degree AV block or other significant body arrhythmia that require permanent pacemaker placement. We also do have a new left bundle branch block that can um, occur after a uh, TAVA. The reason why we have this high incidence of conduction abnormality are also, apart from the close proximity of the anatomy of the conduction system and the aortic valve is because majority of the patients who come for this procedure with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis also do have also problem with the conduction system because just imagine those calcification that we see in the aortic valve can also affect the conduction system. So that is why also majority of them come with comorbid conduction system ab initio prior to um, having the procedure. Even when we do the procedure, they also uh, may develop some conduction abnormality. So I wanted to show us this um, slide here to let us know for those of us that we still remember our anatomy here, um, to know that um, we know that the AV node is just at the lower part of the interatrial septum. And then if you remember your congenital, uh, one of the things we learn about in congenital is that the tricuspid valve as opposed to the mitral valve is more apically displaced. So you have that uh, part of the um, interventricular septum that connects the uh, right uh, left ventricle with the right atrium. And in the uppermost part of that is the membranous septum. And that is where uh, the um, bundle of he is actually penetrates into and then goes down and then divides into the right bundle and the left bundle. The left bundle is more superficial in the subendocardium more than the right bundle. So, and it's also closer to the aortic valve. And that also gives us um, more uh, new left bundle branch block after uh, tavia. And also those of us that are also uh, aware, um, this slide will also show you where the um, bundle of his is in that uh, membranous septum. So this part here, um, in that thin part is where the membranous septum is. So with that being close to the aortic valve, there's a risk of um, bundle branch um, problem after TAVA. And then also those of us who are more into EP will remember the triangle of um, hook. And um, that also has to do with um, where the uh, uh, coronary sinus um, level is with the uh, tendon of Todaro and also the um, septal attachment of tricuspid valve. So just beneath the apex of that triangle is where the um, AV node comes out and then um, pierces the, the membranous septum um, as a bundle of his. And those places are also in close proximity to the aortic valve. So what are the predictors uh, based on previous studies that have been done and um, predictors of conduction disturbances? One major important thing is the depth of the insertion of the TAVA valve. So the more deep into the ventricle you place the TAVA valve, the more likelihood you're gonna have a conduction abnormality, especially a left, bond left bundle branch block. 
And this you can see that um, in this uh, study that was published um, by uh, Pizer in 2008, uh, when the, um, the depth of implantation of the type of valve is more, then new onset left bundle branch block is going to be more. The other uh, clinical um, demographic factors that has been shown um, to increase the risk of the conduction abnormalities uh, sex, female patients are more at risk of having this um, conduction abnormality because they more of less have a more elliptical left ventricular outflow tract. And then advanced age also come with calcification and also um, calcification of the conduction system. Diabetes, we know um, CAD and also people who have had a prior um, cabbage. Then also the anatomic um, uh, factors is like I said, the membranous septum length. So the longer the length of the membranous septum, the more likelihood of damaging the, um, the um, conduction system. And also if you have a high calcium burden, and if the location is also close to that place, and then it may lead to more increase in um, conduction abnormality or even permanent pacemaker uh, need. And then the annulus of the LVOT area. So what we try to do is that when we size the valve, we want to make sure that the valve size is not bigger than the annulus or the LVOT area. And like I said, the LVOT electricity can also be a contributing factor to development of this conduction abnormality. One other important thing when you look at the EKG, uh, we should always be mindful of is if a patient has a pre-existing right bundle branch block before this type of procedure, we consider those patients at increased risk, higher risk than normal people. Uh, because like I said, if they already had a pre-existing right bundle branch block and then you put a tab where they likely may have left bundle branch block, then that potents more danger. And we're gonna look more into the uh, results of some studies that were done. Then first degree AV block um, is also one of the factors we look at for, and usually also prolonged QRS. If um, the absolute number and also if the um, difference after the procedure is more than 20 milliseconds. We already uh, looked at the TAVA uh, depth implantation. Uh, we talked about the sizing. And also another consideration is if you anticipate you're going to do a pre or post dilation after placing the TAVA. Because sometimes, because of the amount of calcium that is in the aortic valve area, sometimes we may elect to do pre dilation first before we put the valve. And also, sometimes when we put the valve and we see there's a lot of paravalvular leak, we may also do a post dilation. So those dilation also would increase your risk of developing a conduction abnormality. So one of the um, mechanisms of, um, of um, this conduction abnormality is the direct compression like we talked about because the aortic valve and the conduction system are in close, close proximity. So direct compression is one of them. Then because of the deployment of the valve, you can have hemorrhage or hematoma around that area then also ischemic injury and inflammation. But we noticed that over some days that the hemorrhage and inflammation may improve over time. And if they do improve, then sometimes the conduction abnormality that we have, either left bundle branch block may also improve. So that is why sometimes we don't rush to put a permanent pacemaker. We do usually put a temporary pacemaker, which I'm gonna talk about. So, um, Basically, in terms of the timing of uh, permanent pacemaker, we've noticed based on the TVT registry. So usually all the people who do um, TAVA here in America, we put all our information into the TVT registry. So with that, we uh, looked at uh, this uh, publication that was done and from 2013 to 2018, we noticed that um, the incidence uh, or the number of patients who had a permanent pacemaker has relatively remained the same, almost around between 10 to 15% over the years. But you notice that for the uh, orange one, that the people who now got a pacemaker after the shot has also increased over those time. So we will look to see if this is really necessary that we put a, a lot of pacemaker in this uh, patient. So um, this, this slide here is showing you that um, the timing of permanent pacemaker placing that majority of the patients get their permanent pacemaker within uh, two days. Uh, that's what eight hours. Um, some do eventually get it later on, uh, but majority and the most 
uh, amount of patient getting within the first uh, 48 hours. So for the next slide, uh, I just wanted to highlight that the majority of the new left bundle branch block are transient. So um, and up to 40% of them resolve by the time the patient is discharged. And even when they are discharged, the remaining 60%, about 30 to 50% of them resolve by 30 days. So um, pacemaker is not really needed in some of these patients if they are stable. And we know that left bundle branch block can also be stable and asymptomatic and do not need a permanent pacemaker placement. But like I said, if a patient already had a pre-existing right bundle branch block and then now they look to a new left bundle branch block that is persistent, then those patients will definitely will need a, a pacemaker, permanent pacemaker. So majority of the uh, indication for permanent pacemaker after uh, TARA, uh, majority is due to high degree of complete heart block. That's where we usually put majority of the pacemaker, almost up to 80% in some studies, uh, followed by um, um, six sinus syndrome and then um, second degree um, AV block, second degree type two AV, AV block. So, uh, the price uh, three clinical trial um, was looked into because some of those patients that we know that got um, permanent pacemaker, we wanted to look at how many of those patients were eventually pacemaker dependent. And you will see from this slide that um, when you look at uh, 30 days as opposed to one year, that there's a decrease in number of patients who are pacemaker uh, dependent. So meaning that some of those patients who really got the pacemaker may not eventually need the pacemaker. <clears throat> so let's look at the overall incidence of um, uh, permanent pacemaker uh, after TAVR. So uh, one of the factors to consider, uh, especially like I said, if a patient had a pre-existing right bundle branch block is to know which of the valve am I gonna use more to reduce the incidence of left bundle branch block or significant conduction abnormality. So um, the core valve has more risk of um, developing um, um, conduction abnormality than in a pacemaker. The rate is about 25% plus or minus, as opposed to the Edwards uh, valve, which is about 6%. So the Edwards valve are safer in terms of conduction abnormality and the core valve, which are self-expanding valves. So the Edwards valve are balloon expandable. We use the, they are, the valves are mounted on a balloon and we use the balloon to expand the valve, but the core valve expand on their own. They are self-expanding. And because of their length, they are longer usually than the Edward valve. So they have more risk of uh, having a conduction um, abnormality, about 25%. And we talked about the uh, advancement in the um, TAVA valves that have been going on over the years. And uh, when uh, the first set of TAVA valve recipient partner one trial was done, the rate of pacemaker, um, uh, new pacemaker placement after 30 days is about 6.8%. Then, then came the Sapien 3 valve, which was a modification from the earlier um, Sapien valve, the Edward valve. Uh, so because of the bulky nature of the initial part of that um, Sapien 3, the incidence of uh, pacemaker placement was noted to increase. Then we now got this um, S3 Ultra and the, um, the incident has come back to around that 6% that it was initially. So looking at the Medtronic valve, um, like I told you that uh, the instance of permanent pacemaker placement in Medtronic valve are higher, usually in about 50%. And this also shows us the evolution from the initial um, um, Medtronic valve to the Evolute R and then the Evolute Pro. But usually you still see that the, the uh, permanent pacemaker incidence here is um, in double digit. So we also have some other uh, valves that we usually don't use it um, most here. I don't know if you guys use it in Europe, uh, Lotus Edge and all that. Um, so this is just to let you know that either way that the incidence is still uh, a bit high in most of these uh, valves. So then let's look at the um, new onset left bundle branch block. Right, so the incidence of new left bundle branch block in patients after TAVA as opposed to if they had a surgery is 22% overall. Uh, like I said, if you now want to uh, divide it into um, Medtronic core valve versus Sapien valve, you now see the uh, variation, but this is just telling the overall that 
you're likely going to have new unstellar bundle branch block after TABA compared to surgery, as uh, noted by Babanti uh, et al. in 2017. So, so what are the adverse clinical impact at one year of tabar related conduction disturbances? Because, um, like I said, the right bundle branch block that was pre-existing is a bad omen for these patients. So we usually take them more seriously. But for patients who develop left bundle branch block without a prior right bundle branch block, um, studies have shown that uh, the development of that left bundle branch block um, have varying um, effect on the patient. So in this uh, meta-analysis that was done uh, by Farox, they found that if a patient develops a new onset persistent left bundle branch block after one year or at one year, that they have increased all-cause mortality, increased uh, cardiac mortality, heart failure hospitalization, and also need for permanent pacemaker placement. And then uh, if they eventually get a permanent pacemaker placement, uh, there's also increased all-cause mortality and heart failure um, hospitalization in this patient. So the next slide is just looking at um, uh, partner two um, trial, uh, sub part of the partner two trial, which looked at the clinical impact of new onset persistent left bundle branch block in intermediate risk uh, patient, because uh, partner two dealt mostly with intermediate risk uh, TAVA patients. So you can see from here that if a patient develops left bundle branch block at this chart, this one is at this chart. Usually when we do the TAVA here in America, if, if they are very stable, they go home the next day. If they are not that very stable, we keep them longer, maybe two or three days and then decide if they need a pacemaker. But if a patient develops left bundle branch block and was discharged, um, it has been shown uh, that um, they have also increased um, um, all-cause mortality and also increase uh, cardiovascular death. That is death due to cardiovascular causes. Oh, um, yeah. Right. Sorry to disturb. There's a question. <clears throat> There's a question in the chat group that says, yeah. "Thank you for the great presentation." But any reason why the incidence of pacemaker is higher with the self-expanding valve as compared to the balloon expandable, since one of the risk factor for heart block is pre and post dilatation. And okay, that's a good question. So, um, like I said, if if I put a picture. Maybe I should have put it. So I put a picture. Okay, so can you see the metronic core valve? Yes. You see how the length is. You compare it to the um, Edward valve. The Edward valve is shorter. So the Edward valve has a less risk of going to that membranous septum. Remember, we said that the conduction abnormality goes through that membranous septum. So the, the Edward valve is short. So usually when you put it, it just stays up there. It doesn't get down to the membranous um, septum. But the core valve, because of the length, uh, usually a lot of them presses on that membranous septum, and that is why. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it does, yeah. OK, all right. Thank you. Yeah, so. Um, <clears throat> The other thing we're going to be looking at for here, sorry, I'm using my phone, so I don't see those questions. So if you see any question, just highlight it to me. So the yeah. other thing we look at for here is um, new level the branch block after TAVA. We, it's been shown by Irena in 2015 that it's associated with sudden cardiac death. So the reason why I'm bringing this is that some people have made the argument that if a patient develops persistent new onset level of branch block, uh, bundle branch block that we should put a pacemaker on them. So this study, and all these studies that I've been telling you about, there's no randomized control trial in any of them, just to point it out here. The majority of them are either through retrospective study or through a cohort uh, prospective study, but none has been uh, randomized. So we kind of uh, use some of these things just to help us. And even in 2020, uh, the um, American College of uh, Cardiology expert panel just sat down together and decided to give like expert guidance um, in what we do in this uh, patient. So um, the, the development of new onset persistent bundle branch block, left bundle, has been shown uh, to increase uh, sudden cardiac death. And then if the QRS duration in this patient who developed left bundle branch block 
is more than 160 milliseconds, there are even higher risk of uh, sudden cardiac death. So these are the patients that uh, most of the time we go ahead and put a pacemaker on if their TRS <laughs> is usually more than 160 milliseconds based on some of these um, um, studies that were done. But it's also good to note that in this uh, study, they looked about uh, 3,700 patients and 57% of them were balloon expandable while uh, for three were self expanding. And then also they also looked at if your EF is lower, you have a higher uh, mortality. So combining the partner one and partner two analysis for the EF evolution, that 11 clarification fraction evolution, um, this showed that if a patient um, develop a new or cell left on the branch block, their EF goes lower over time. Um, and if they got a pacemaker, it also goes lower, but not as lower as just having left bundle branch block without a pacemaker. So this is the argument that some people are making that if a patient has left bundle branch block and even the QRS is quite wide, that we should put a pacemaker in them. Then come another study that kind of uh, threw everything in the wind and kind of let us know that probably uh, um, left bundle branch block is not that very bad in some of these patients. So this patient's uh, total population was about um, 1,020 patients, and they did not have any prior or any hospital permanent pacemaker placement. So they did not have any permanent pacemaker placement before they were even discharged. And they did not have a prior left bundle branch block. So these are patients who developed new onset uh, left bundle branch block after TARA. And there were about 20% of patients with that, uh, about 212 patients. So, this uh, graph here is showing us that um, even if they have level of branch block, that there's no difference in mortality, no difference in hospitalization, no difference in terms of um, uh, pacemaker at follow. Uh, sorry, actually, they had more uh, pacemaker if they developed um, level of branch block. So those patients had a pacemaker placed in them. But based on the first two slides here, you see that there's no in in difference in death, there's no difference in heart failure admission. Uh, so this kind of threw everything out of the window for us. But like I said, these two studies, none of them is a um, randomized control trial. So what we do most of the time is that if the QRS is quite wide, like 160 and above, we usually go ahead and put a pacemaker in them. Okay, then, um, go ahead. Um, there's a question here. Um, mm -hmm. thanks, for, thanks for the wonderful lecture. Uh, what is the timeline for the persistence left bundle branch after block, after TAVI, um, and the patient develops complete heart block? How, how long do you monitor before you decide it's persistent and requires permanent? Do you, I think you said one year, after one year, is it? Is it, is it left bundle branch block or you're talking about... Left, about left, left, left bundle branch, branch block. block, left bundle. Yes, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but if, if it's a um, complete heart block, we usually don't wait. So what the most we wait is for two days. We wait for two days and see if the inflammation and if the uh, if the hematoma is going to resolve and, and then, because we put temporary pacemaker, temporary transvenous pacemaker in all these patients, if, even on, on the procedure table, we do that. And then we monitor them in the ICU why they still have the temporary pacemaker in some group of patients, which we are going to look into. But uh, we're going to look into that and we'll let you know. So I don't then um, forget. Okay. All right. So um, we talked about um, the incidence of untangling of permanent pacemaker placement post -tab. So majority of them you can see here who had their left uh, persistent uh, left bundle branch block got theirs in less than one month. But even so, even after two years, still. Uh, some got there, but you see that the difference here was not statistically significant. For um, 24 months, 12 to 24 months, and also it's on the bottom line for 3 to 12 months. So, but majority of them got there in less than one month, and that was um, and there was no difference in terms of this. Um, we know that um, permanent pacemaker placement is not without any complication, um, even though, yes, uh, with the people knowing about how to place it, the uh, complications for permanent pacemaker has uh, reduced, but still, it's good to know that uh, this is not a benign procedure that um, you don't just uh, put it unless it is absolutely necessary. If it's not necessary, uh, you don't um, go ahead to uh, put it. All right, so, 
I got this slide from the ACC um, panel uh, that sat in 2019 and published their recommendation in 2020. So this is what we do for uh, preterm patients. So if a patient has um, high risk features and they divided these high risk features here into ECG predictors, procedural features and CT predictors. So if they have a prior right bundle branch block or they have a first degree heart block, it shows us that um, these patients are at increased risk. Or like I said, if they have a self-expanding valve based on what we talked about, or if the prosthesis, the TAVA valve itself is bigger than the LVOT diameter. Uh, if they have a, you are expecting that you're going to put a low implantation depth, or if they have a pre or post deployment balloon valve low plastic, then they are also at increased risk. Then if they have heavy calcification, like we talked about, or if they have um, um, a, um, actually should be um, long um, membranous septum actually, and uh, then they would uh, uh, need to be considered as increased risk. So we cancel all these patients um, and tell them that they have higher risk of kidney and pacemaker if they have this increased risk. And then um, they screen the patient for any um, prior reading abnormalities. Sometimes we do some ambulatory monitoring first to make sure they don't have any indication that would need a pacemaker even before the permanent, uh, before the TAVA procedure. And then one important thing is that if they are on any medication, whether it be beta blocker, that they need for any indication, either for ischemic heart disease or for liver clot dysfunction, the recommendation is not to stop those medications. If they've been stable on those medications prior to the TAVA, and they have any of these risk factors, they have first degree heart block, right bundle branch block, recommendation do not stop them because if you stop them, something has shown that they do worse if you stop those medications. So continue those medications if the patient has been stable on those medications prior to the TAVA, even if they have the high risk factors, they have right bundle branch block, continue those medications. Then you also need to schedule the TAVA at a time when a physician that is training permanent pacemaker placement uh, is available to do a permanent pacemaker placement. But like I said, these days we do temporary pacemakers so we can even do it and then wait two days for permanent pacemaker placement to be done. If somebody who is knowledgeable in permanent pacemaker placement is not available. And then we consider um, heart valves um, that are less likely to um, give you um, 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 heart block. Okay, so this is also part of their uh, recommendation, like I talked about uh, from the scientific uh, expert panel, and they looked at the ECGs and um, risk factors, and if there's no ECG changes, no pre-existing right bundle branch block, then you don't even need a permanent a temporary pacemaker. So what we do is, when we, we, before we start the procedure, we get um, arterial access, usually sometimes uh, through the common femoral artery. We also get a venous access and put a temporary pacemaker before we put the TAVA. So if a patient did not have any ECG changes after the TAVA and also did not have a pre-existing right bundle branch block, we remove the temporary pacemaker just before the patient leaves the procedure room. If they have some ECG changes or they have a pre-existing um, right bundle branch block, then we keep the temporary pacemaker for at least 24 hours overnight. And then we see them again the next day, see if they have no further episode, then you can remove the temporary pacemaker. But if they have a need for that, you may construct a permanent pacemaker. Sometimes in some patients who are neither here nor there, we can do also, or we re they did recommend the um, EP study, and they look at the HB interval, and they usually recommend that if it's more than 70 or 75 milliseconds, uh, that's the conduction time from the his bundle to the ventricle. Uh, they do that uh, for us, and then the EP guys do it for us. And if it's that much, then uh, they put a permanent pacemaker. Then uh, intraprocedural, uh, like I said, uh, continue the guideline directed medical therapy if they need it for any reason, either for ischemic heart disease level and blood dysfunction. And then of all our patients these days, we put a temporary um, transvenous pacemaker. And also you need to discuss uh, potential permanent pacemaker uh, placement and obtain a consent before the procedure because you know the patient is gonna be sedated. So you obtain the consent before uh, the procedure. Then if there's no new conduction disturbances, the temporary pacemaker, like I said, can be removed prior to the patient leaving the room. 
If uh, the patient develops some conduction abnormality that needs um, the temporary pacemaker to be placed for some time, we we'll put it in for 24 to 48 hours and regulate the patient. And if after that 24 to 48 hours, the patient still has a need for that permanent pacemaker, uh, for permanent pacemaker, we go ahead and recommend uh, permanent pacemaker placement. The patient needs to be monitored, like I said, and then we'll make the decision based on that. I'm not going to waste much time in this slide. Uh, just some people coming up with some uh, cohort predictive value to tell you, or oh, if they have a combination of right bundle branch block prior, the, uh, um, uh, the membranous septum length and all that. Um, this is just a, a predictive uh, uh, model, but I'm not going to waste my time into that. All right. So also, uh, the MIDAS also looked at the depth according to the membranous septum and also uh, divided them into if they have a membrane septum that is more than five millimeter, they are considered uh, uh, low risk. All right, so uh, the next is um, the post tumor management. Um, so if they have symptomatic bradycardia, high degree of block, complete heart block, they need a permanent pacemaker, you put them before the patient leaves the hospital. If they have a new or progressive or pre-existing conduction uh, disturbances that changes post-procedure, we can also monitor or consider EP study, like I said, or put a permanent pacemaker based on maybe if the left bundle branch block is more than 160 milliseconds. Um, also, narrow QRS uh, before and after TAVA, uh, EP study is not indicated. And then on this charge, um, if they do not have any need for primary pacemaker uh, indication, there's no new first degree or second degree AV block, no new bundle branch block. Uh, patient can be discharged early. Usually we discharge them the next day if there's no uh, problem. If there's problem, we'll keep them at least for 48 hours. And even when we discharge them, sometimes we put a cardiac monitor on them for at least 14 days. In fact, some people also have gone ahead. Sometimes I've seen some of our colleagues who recommended them um, um, loop recorder for even more than one year. So this is something that um, you need to think about. All right. So uh, we already went through this slide, so I'm not going to go to that. So uh, in terms of what is the value of um, post-procedure ECG? So because uh, we know that delayed high degree AV block may occur in about 2 to 10% of patients. So some patients may not have that um, high degree AV block, but may develop, develop it uh, late. And the delayed number there is 48 hours. So any high degree AV block that develops after 48 hours is considered a delay. So that is why even when we see them in the clinic, we like to at least do an EKG on them if they do not have any monitor, um, because we know that about two to 10% may develop high degree AV block after uh, for eight hours in this patient. And if they do have that, um, um, then maybe they may need um, an end pacemaker placement. And the absolute value and change in the QRS and PR intervals have also been shown to be very important in this patient. All right, so we talked about those patients who had a um, pre-existing right bundle branch block. And I told you that these patients are one of the highest risk patients. And the reason also, if you look at it critically, is that they already have a right bundle branch block. And then you're going to put a pacemaker that may affect their left bundle. So basically, you're kind of giving them high degree AV block. Um, so... Uh, so these patients are very high risk group and the baseline right bone bundle branch block has been associated with mortality after TAVRA, as you can see from the first graph and also the second one. So the first one, if they have a right bundle branch block, they have increased mortality. And then the second one is also divided them into if they have prior right bundle branch block or not. So like if they do not have a prior bundle, right bundle branch block, then they are almost like most other people. So this is just to show, show that you could get away with having a prior right bundle branch, a left bundle branch block prior to TAVA and be okay. But if you have a prior right bundle branch block, there's usually more, uh, they are more at risk. And then we talked about patients who also had a, a loop recorder, like we said, they monitor them over years. And this was monitored more than one year and you see uh, the um, body arrhythmia event in this patient is over that, those years. So in uh, conclusion, uh, 
production abnormalities and disturbances, which include a new light bundle branch block, permanent pacemaker placement remain a frequent complication of TAVA. And then the TAVA related conduction disturbances are still with adverse outcome, including uh, mortality. And then you have to place a careful attention to look at the risk factors and the predictors and see how you can modify them in terms of make sure you get the right um, size of the TAVA valve for the LVOT. We use CT scan these days for sizing, but um, in third world countries, uh, we can also use um, TEE for doing those if um, we don't have a CT. But um, I speak with Edafi a lot and we have a CT scan now in Africa. So <laughs> we can do that very well in Africa right away. And then um, make sure you don't do a depth um, implantation into the LVOT and then decide, am I going to use um, a pre or post dilation ahead of time? And that will help you know. So uh, recent advances in management of conditional uh, disturbances have been um, explored by Jack, like I said, and then you need to make a careful management of high risk group patient post procedure. And then guideline indication for permanent pacemaker implantation is also followed. So whether they are going to have this tower or not, if they meet any indication for permanent pacemaker placement, irrespective of the tower, they need a permanent pacemaker uh, placement. And that is it. So this is um, people that um, the places I got my um, slides and then uh, recommendations and everything. Thank you. Excellent, excellent talk, Dr. Obiara. That's fantastic. Um, I've got one question. One question. Sure. It says, are there patients that can only receive the self-expanding valves? Um, are there are, are, are there self-expanding valves shorter than the Medtronic valves? So if a patient mm -hmm. must be on self-expanding valve, how do we limit the risk of complete heart block or left bundle branch block? All right. So this is a very good question. So what we find out most of the time is that in order to reduce um, paravalvular leak, uh, if they have a lot of calcium, usually self-expanding valve has been shown to be better in that sense. So some of those patients may benefit more from self-expanding valve. But if you're going to do that, then you try to see if you can do uh, less depth implantation in those patients. But in terms of complication, I want to say at this point that the incidence of um, um, bundle conduction abnormality and paravalvular leak are kind of inversely related because the more you try to uh, get the valve more up towards the aorta, the more likely you're going to have a paravalvular leak. And the more you try to get them more into the ventricle, the more likely you're going to press on that membranous septum and cause conduction abnormality. So, but overall, mm -hmm. what we do is that if a patient has a pre-existing right bundle mm -hmm. branch block, we usually prefer Edwards valve to uh, the balloon expandable valve. But uh, there's no advantage of one valve over the other in terms of the efficacy of the valve. So if I'm going to go with a patient who is high risk, I go with Edward valve. That's, that, that's a fantastic answer. Um, I, had, I had a really simple question. I know some of us are not like doctors and some of us are not in um, TAVI implanting centers. So I know a lot of people use you know, they call the acronym TAVI. And, yes. and obviously some people also use TAVA, like you were mm -hmm. saying. Uh, yes. So, so trans, correct me, Uncle, trans catheter aortic valve implantation. Or yeah, one is implantation, catheter. one is replacement. Replacement, okay. But yeah. they're the same, yeah. They're the same, it's just uh, semantics. For some people usually in Europe use the implantation. Or here in America, we use the replacement. Placement, brilliant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I think I had did I have a question? Um, so on 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 average, how long would you expect like a TAVI patient? See, like the reason why you might implant it, because usually, usually the first point of call is it like did they have a valve replacement, like an open heart surgery, or is it those patients that are quite like feeble and quite old that they will um, that you know, um, a, a proper surgery would be too much for them. So TAVI would be the next, the best option for them. Is that is that 
Yeah, so, so okay, let me go through the evolution of Tavi or Tava, right? So when Tavi came in initially, it was for those who are called inoperable, those who are not um, uh, surgery patients. That's when uh, Tava came out initially. But over the years, they reduced it to only those who are high risk. So they use um, what we call SDS score, uh, which the surgeons use to determine if a patient is high risk. So if a patient has about 4% or less, they are considered low risk, 4 to 8% or so, they are considered intermediate risk, and then more than 8% is high risk. Then with more evolution, a study was also done like in partner three trial and all that. And we have also seen that even low risk patients these days can also have um, TAVA. So right now, it's now basically depending on, you look at a lot of factors, you look at if a patient will also will need coronary artery bypass graft at the same time, because if they do, you may consider to just replace their valve surgically and also do the bypass uh, graft for the coronaries at the same time. Uh, so um, the, the dynamics are changing now. And also right now, I've even seen some young patients even getting TAVA because of the advancement uh, in TAVA procedures. So we do that. And then we also have what we call ta uh, um, TAVA valve in valve. So because the initial point is that TAVA valve may not last long, but some studies have now shown that even they are also lasting longer. And even if they have a problem now, you can also do a valve in valve procedure in this patient. So I don't know if I was able to answer your question or yeah, that's answered it. That's excellent. Really, really good. You really know your stuff. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions? Dr. Daffy? No questions. Um, how many? Okay, so I'll just ask. How many? How, how often do you get? Um, peri procedure complications, like given that most of your most of your patient groupings are, are quite critical and things, is that something that do you get? Is it high death rate, for instance? How often do you get complications, and how do you prep the patient during the procedure? Do you put pads on? So I'm really speaking for the physiologist here. Um, so do you put pads on, and obviously you put a temporary. Um, pacing wire in, um, and and can you can you just go a little bit into that for the physiologist, and, and then basically what rate do you normally pace the um, the pacemaker when you're deploying? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. So um, um, we, like I said, for all the patients, we put a temporary pacemaker uh, because what we don't want is a situation where you're putting the put it ahead of time, place it there, make sure the piece, temporary pacemaker is working so that if we need it, we just turn it on. So that's one. Also, we put a pad on them in case we need to shock them. We don't want to waste time. So we we'll put a pad on them um, uh, to do that. And then uh, in terms of, um, uh, what was your question again? I think there was a question I missed. Yeah, um, so what's, what's the risk? Like how often? Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, so, so, um, like I said, these days, uh, majority of the complications uh, post-TAVA or during TAVA have reduced. In fact, they are almost 1% or less than 1% now, majority. But like I said, the only complication we still get more than others is the conduction abnormality. And because, like I said, we already have a temporary pacemaker, we don't run into emergency because if anything goes wrong, we'll turn on the temporary pacemaker and it starts working and then they can go with that temporary pacemaker into the uh, units, maybe ICU or telemetry floor, whatever you want to put them. So we put that, uh, they have that temporary pacemaker, we monitor them and see if after maybe 24 to 48 hours, if they still need uh, uh, to have a pacemaker implantation, then we can organize for permanent pacemaker uh, reading. But in terms of the other complications, they're almost, almost, almost non-existent. And uh, we usually do not even have any patient that, that because, here in America, still we still have to, to have a CT surgeon in the operating room, and just in case of any problem. But 
of all the times I've had it, I've never had any need for uh, even a CT surgeon going for open heart surgery on a patient because almost all the complications, the valvular complications, the, the um, vascular complications have almost all reduced. They are very, very minimal these days. We hardly ha ever have them. It's just like I said, once in a while um, for the permanent pacemaker placement, we need them, especially if they have a pre-existing right bundle branch block. Oh, fantastic. Any other questions, anyone? So, <clears throat> so TAVI has to be, be performed in a surgical, it has to be a surgical cardiothoracic surgery or vascular surgery site on the hospital. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, you can, yeah. so you need, you need uh, based on the recommendation, I need uh, at least the one as kind of, Kind of thoracic surgeon in the room while uh, you're doing the procedure. Majority of the time, they don't actually do anything. It's the international cardiologist or structural cardiologist that does the procedure itself. But the recommendation here in America is that you need to have a, a cardio thoracic surgeon in the room while you're doing the procedure, just in case there's an emergency. So we use uh, what we call a hybrid room. Hybrid room is a room where you do your um, interventional and structural procedure. But if there's need to have an open heart surgery, they will have it there and then you don't have to move the patient from that room to another room to do the open heart surgery. So the CT surgeon is there, the surgical techs are all there waiting just in case there's any problem. Um, and if you also look at the evolution, even for coronary stenting, when it started initially, we used to have a CT surgeon in the room, but now we don't need CT surgery anymore for coronary stenting. So my, my, my thinking is that in next, some years, maybe five to 10 years, that we may not even need a CT surgeon in the room when we are doing that procedure because um, people would have gotten used to the whole thing. The rate of complication will keep decreasing and we don't need a CT surgeon in the room. So we use right now a hybrid room that can do both cardiac cath and also do open heart surgery. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. I don't know why any new people are not asking questions because it's really interesting. Uh, my last question is, how much, was, are there any significant difference between the Edwards and the Medtronic valves in terms of costing, in terms of prices? Uh, they almost, and, and, almost... Do you think, and do you think, um, since Dr. Daffy is really thinking about starting this in, in Nigeria, like, mm. um, do, what, do you think people can afford it? Or is there any kind of program to help? With, with this? Yeah, so um, I, I talked with uh, Defa about this. So, because uh, this has not been done in Nigeria, at least I know of, I don't know in Ghana, maybe they have done it in Ghana, I don't know, but in Nigeria it's not been done. So we talked about doing it. And one of the things, uh, limiting factor there is the cost of the value itself, because it's very, very expensive here, some in the neighborhood of uh, $40,000. <laughs> So, um, and you know, um, some of the patients in, in back home in our, in our country may not be able to afford that. So one of the things we are gonna to try to do is um, talking to the uh, Boston, uh, to the Medtronic people and Edwards uh, people too, see if there is something that they can give us as a charity. In that case, uh, maybe a patient that needs it will not have to pay a lot of money for it. So that's what we're going to be looking into. But uh, our plan is that uh, at least by next year, uh, this procedure should start being done in, in Nigeria. Oh, excellent. Any questions, anyone? Thank you, Dr. Obiara. Thank you very much for the wonderful and elucidating presentation. We really enjoy your presentation, sir. Thank you, thank, thank you. you very much. Yes, I sir. hope I was yes, able sir. to at least um, answer your questions and if you over any... all the questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> so thank Dr. Um, uh, Julius, uh, Dr. Bera is our uh, structural interventional cardiology and um, we hope that one day, uh, very soon, we'll plan a TAVI in Nigeria with him, as he said, we have not done TAVI in Nigeria. The major reason why it has not been done is because of the cost. If not, we yeah. do see patients randomly. Vocationally, we see patients that require. We, we've lost you, Dr. Daffy. Oh, yeah. I think, Julius, I think you asked one question that I forgot to mention. So 
most of the time, uh, in fact, all the time for the Edward bar, because it's balloon expandable, we usually do what we call overdrive pacing. You guys know about it, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So, yeah, so we do the overdrive pacing, and sometimes we go up to like 180 bits per minute mm -hmm. um, in terms of the rates for the overdrive pacing. So what that helps us do, and we do it in a very fast and, and, and focused way, what that helps us to do is that it kind of makes the heart to go into like a standstill because we want to deploy the valve when the ventricle is not contracting and um, opening the, the native valve in and out and then blood needs to come out. So that overdrive pacing kind of helps the heart to be in a standstill. So where it's kind of beating so very fast that it doesn't even allow much time for realization for blood to come in and then go out. So it kind of gets into a kind of, if, if I may use that word, the equilibrium where the heart is in a standstill and then we quickly deploy the valve um, with the balloon expandable. Sometimes we get away with not overdrive pacing for the Edward valve because those are kind of self-expanded. So we, we, we sometimes don't do overdrive pacing for those ones. For, for Fred Wars, we usually do overdrive pacing. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, very good. Dr. Bira, I have a question. Um, for following up of these patients after uh, TAVI, especially those that have uh, self-expanding uh, uh, valves, uh, mm. Is there any is there any risk that maybe months to years after the implant they may end up having a conduction abnormality? That is one. Then mm. the second the second question is uh, if you had a, a, a valve a, a valve that was already deployed before, and mm. the patient come again for another valve to be redeployed. Is the, uh, does that increase the risk of conduction abnormality among this group of uh, uh, patients? Excellent question. Excellent question. So uh, let me start with the second part where you're talking about like a valve in valve procedure, right? So yes, correct. If, if they already had a valve, so that valve is like a method that's already kind of been protective. So we've not noticed any increase in the conduction abnormality in those patients because the first valve is already sitting there and it doesn't allow the second one to uh, impinge on the conduction system. So we've not noticed any, any increase in, in those patients with valve and valve. Then your first question uh, was, uh, remind me your first question. Yeah, the first one is, uh, especially the self-expanding valve that are longer Oh, okay, yes, the yes. balloon expandable valves. Yes. If yes. you follow them up after you deploy them uh, mm -hmm. immediately, there was no conduction abnormality, but mm -hmm. you follow them up for months to years. Yes. Has there been incident of conduction abnormality among them? Because I have a patient, I'm mm -hmm. following up one patient who had uh, TAVI in uh, uh, in Europe. Yes. So is uh, yes, he, he had a TAVI in Europe and came back to Nigeria. So I've been the one following uh, following her up. She's an elderly woman. Uh, I've not seen any of this uh, issue. I'm asking yeah. all this one because although we have not started, I'm sure. Right, I think we lost you, definitely. But let me answer the question if you guys are hearing me. Um, so basically, um, if they did not have any um, prior EKG abnormality before TAVA, and after TAVA yes. they did not have any abnormality, they are unlikely, you know, in medicine you never say never, but they are unlikely yeah. to have any conduction abnormality later on, okay? Oh, Unless, yeah. like I said, you know, this some of these conduction abnormalities are age-related. Like as somebody gets older, the conduction system may start getting weaker and calcium may start um, impinging on those uh, conduction systems. So they may develop that uh, conduction abnormality irrespective that they got a TAVA. I don't know if I'm making sense. So yes, it means correct. that they don't get a TAVA that maybe they were supposed to get the conduction abnormality over time with age, but not because they got a TAVA. So if they did not have a prior right bundle branch block, no conduction abnormality prior to the TAVA. And then within that for eight hours, they did not have any EKG changes whatsoever. Then it's unlikely they're gonna develop it based on the TAVA. If they develop the conduction abnormality is because they were meant to develop it. 
But if they had uh, prior changes, yes, those people usually would may uh, develop a condition of normality more than the other first group of people I mentioned. It's clear. Thank you very much, sir. Brilliant, brilliant. I've got my last question, and I said, this is so good and interesting. That's why we're, we're <laughs> <on>. <laughs> so, um, in, in centers, because I know that you and Dr. Daffy are, are vascular um, surgeons as well. You can do peripheral vascular, you know, you can treat yeah. peripheral vascular diseases. So, so you are perfectly suited to do, you know, TAVIs in case of complications, with getting exactly vascular. exactly because uh, the sheet we use for this um TAVI procedures are big sheets you know uh yeah. from 11 french to 14 french sheets uh so these are big uh, vascular uh, sheet that uh, you have to be knowledgeable in peripheral most of the time to be able to do this uh, without any problem because sometimes i've had a case let me tell you this so i've had a case where um um, majority of the time we do TAVA through the um, common femoral artery. That's where we do majority of the TAVA. But we soon can do transcarotid, there's transcarotid, there's transepical, you know? So there are different other places you can uh, uh, do the uh, TAVA from, but majority, 90% of the cases is through the femoral. So I've had a case where a patient uh, was not a candidate for this other uh, kind of femoral, uh, this kind of route to do the tablet procedure. And they also have, uh, in both the iliacs, they have significant disease, right? So when we went in, it was difficult to pass uh, the equipment through those iliac disease. So we had to actually, first of all, do iliac scenting on those patients to be able to get access to now be able to pass our equipment to do the tablet. So it's usually better if you have um, a, a, a good knowledge of uh, Well, we've lost you there, Dr. Obiero. Hello, Dr. Obiero. All right. <clears throat> no, we've lost him. Right. Okay. Um, it's, <clears throat> I think, I think he's done absolutely fantastically well. I think it's a really interesting era. It's been a really, um, exciting presentation that we've all really, really enjoyed. Um, so, um, and I'm sure you guys have all enjoyed it as well. Um, yeah. so, I mean, it's, we've, we've done this, obviously there was a, um, an earlier glitch technically, but um, I think we've covered quite, we've done it for quite a long time. So do you guys want to quickly run through the EGM questions that EG um, set last time? I mean, you were given the answers last time anyway. So um, have, have you guys got any questions with regards to that? Um, Elvis. Uh, Elvis. Um, is he still there? Because he had to go away. He, sa he said he had to go away. Um, oh, anyway. Okay. Um, Maybe yeah. can we take, Rogelius, can I please that we take the question next week? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. It's a plead. Okay. So ne next week, obviously, we're in Abuja, all being well, God willing. Yes. So, <laughs> so, so you'll be in Abuja. AJ will be there. You'll yes, be there. Yes. So, uh, Doctor Doctor Mr. Pana is presenting. Oh, is he is he presenting? Definitely, yeah. Yes, she is presenting. Um, um, uh, Lab Bondo, uh, Lab uh, Bondo branch piece in next week. Okay, so I said I was speaking to AG earlier. Um, so let let me let me stop the recording. Um, I have to claim re reclaim. Uh, I think he's logged out. Let me just. Well, I think I'm not it's sure. Dr. Yeah. Obiara will give you the whole thing. Yeah, I'm not sure because I think he came out, he logged out without um ending. So I don't know what's happened there. <laughs> Hello, sorry. I don't know what happened. Sorry. Can you, can you hear me <laughs> it's now? It's all right, Dr. That, yeah. That's Yeah, we can hear you now. We can hear you. So, yeah. I don't know. Where did, I, where did you guys stop hearing me? So. <laughs> 
It right at the very <laughs> end. I think you said everything. So it was right okay. at the very end. And okay, okay. I was saying, I think we're both saying how an excellent, um, you know, um, present, presenter you are. And and it was a very interesting topic. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And that's Thank you. Enjoyed. So, you know, so are you more into device? Uh, what are you more into? So I'm a device physiologist. So, okay. so I'm the one that obviously we are the guys that implant it, you know, and, and we do the programming with the consultant, obviously. Um, okay. We do the programming and, and things. So um, oh, okay. um, the center that I used to work in in Scotland before I moved to right. Northampton used to do Tavi. They only did it. Oh. And they just recently started doing it. Um, mm -hmm. So I had a small, small, small knowledge of it. Small, small knowledge of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that, so it was very, it was saving so many lives, so many. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. 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 I, I have a lot of patients who, before this tabby process was started, they would not have allowed it to do open heart surgery on them. So, but these days when I tell them, oh, you have option of having a tabby and they will go through your groin.